<clears throat> we're continuing our series of the Sermon on the Mount, and I know we have some visitors with us, and we've been talking about how it's the most negative sermon in all the Bible because it contains no's and nots and nors. But yet, as we can see, you know, when people think about negative sermons today, it actually, when you think about Jesus' sermon, it's, it actually changes you. It transforms you so much, more than we could ever know. And as we've been seeing through this sermon that the greatest preacher who ever preached, we see Jesus Christ basically trying to go against those who were the Pharisees of his day, who were sadly uh, stacking up oral traditions against the law of God. And so, oops, sorry about that. So, it's important to see that we want to uphold what Jesus says while we do not want to follow the traditions of men. And so I want us to look at tonight the patience to endure hostility. I think it's very important as Christians that we develop the fruit of the Spirit, and part of that fruit of the Spirit is having patience, having patience with other people, especially towards those who hate us, who curse us, who despitefully use us. That's very important that we understand what Jesus says here. So he begins by saying in verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn to the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. So if, if you will, we're going to look at three points tonight. I want us to first of all to look at the background of the Old Testament of what Jesus is talking about. Secondly, I want us to look at Jesus' bold teaching. I mean, look at how bold Jesus is in going back to what is right. And then thirdly, i like for us to look at the best way is always God's way and only God's way. So if you look at the background, uh, we know that Jesus is referring to one of these three scriptures. Uh, and he's even referring to Exodus 21 where it says, But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. The next one is Leviticus 24. If a man causes a disfigurement of his neighbor as he has done, so shall it be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he has caused disfigurement of a man so shall it be done to him. And then the last one, Deuteronomy 19.21, Your eye shall not pity, life shall be for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Now, to understand what Jesus is discussing here, uh, he's discussing how what the Pharisees had done is they'd taken this rule which was only used in the courts of law, only the judges could administer true justice and use this law. But what the Pharisees were doing is taking it and they were applying it to personal retaliation. So if somebody hurts my foot, then I can get revenge and I can, you know, kick their foot and break it. So that's basically what's going on here. Uh, and so we see this idea of equivalence, right? Foot for foot, eye for eye. Uh, and, you know, we see this in our world today. We see people who, if you retaliate against them, well, they're going to retaliate back against you. And we see this, in the, sadly, between the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis all the time. You shoot, they shoot something at the Palestinians, Palestinians, Palestinians react. But you even see it in, even in families, right? Your little brother hits you, well, you hit them back. But... What usually happens is, right, you get you hit them even harder, right? Well, it's supposed to be equal <laughs> amount, right? But we know that kids shouldn't fight with one another. But this is what people do to justify themselves, and that's what they were doing. And for the reason I believe God gave this law is because he knows our hearts. He knows how far man will go. He knows how deep and corrupted man is. And so as you read in the Bible... The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
In Psalm 44, 20 and 21, if we had forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a foreign God, would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. And in Jeremiah 10, 23, O Lord, I know the way of man is not himself. It is not a man who walks to direct his own steps. So as you can see, what, what would happen if we did not have the, the necessary laws to restrain ourselves? Well, as you well know, it would be total chaos. Just think about any society without laws today. Or even church. In a church or even in a school. I mean, things would just go out of hand. And so that's why God made it necessary to give the law of Moses to restrain evil in the hearts of men, even though he knew that they would commit sin. For example, Paul talks about the necessary function of the law of Moses. He says, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there's any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine, you, and you can see, in the, if you look very closely, those are all following the Ten Commandments that were found under the law of Moses. And in Romans 7, verse 12, Therefore the law is holy, and the commandments holy, just, and good. And so, like we've been saying, this law was necessary. And uh, it was basically trying to warn the evildoer not to want to commit such a crime. Uh, not to commit such a th misdeed because they knew that in a court of law, then they would have the same exact punishment done to them. But even further, if you look, uh, another reason that was this law was given was to pre was that these judges who were sadly prejudiced, it would keep them from uh, giving a punishment that was more severe than that than what fitted the crime. So you see this in Exodus 21. It says in Exodus 21, uh, verses 15 through 22, as you can see, it says, And he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. He who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. If men contend with each other, and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, and he does not die but is confined to his bed, if he rises again and walks about outside with his staff, then he who struck him shall be acquitted. He shall only pay for the loss of his time and shall provide for him to be thoroughly killed. And so you can see there where it is the case that, that a man, where we talk about these men fighting with each other and the exact punishment that was given. But also we see here that, you know, under the law of Moses, there was something that if you accidentally killed someone, uh, if you were working on a construction project and uh, let's say there was a guy below you and you were stacking up stones and one stone just sadly you, you put it there, but I don't know, somehow you, you missed it and it dropped over and hit the person on the head and killed him. Well, that was unintentional. You didn't mean to kill this person. And so the law of Moses had this regulation of these ref cities of refuge. And you read about these in Numbers 35. So Numbers 30, 35, verse, beginning with verse 10, says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you cross the Jordan to the land of Canaan, then you shall appoint cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the manslayer who kills any person accidentally may flee there. They shall be cities of refuge for you from the avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation in judgment. Also, you see this um, in Deuteronomy 19 as well. So, like we were saying before, if you cause some kind of disfigurement, then the courts were to punish you with that same exact equivalent. And that's what, and once again, I stress that this was done by the courts. This was not done on a personal uh, level. So that's why we read in Deuteronomy 19, for example, where it says, If a false witness rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, then both men in the controversy shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who serve in those days, 
And the judges shall make careful inquiry. And indeed, if the witness is a false witness who has testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother. So you shall put away the evil from among you. And those who remain shall hear in fear, and thereafter they shall not again commit such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity. This is for the judges. Life shall be for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So just remember these three things, if you will, as we've gone through this Old Testament regulations of the law. We've seen how is the case that, number one, you see that this was done by the courts, not by on a personal level. Secondly, it was supposed to be equitable, foot for foot, eye for an eye. But also it taught equality before the law. But let's look at what Jesus says more carefully. So we're looking at how Jesus is very bold in what he says. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. So when you think about what these uh, Jewish leaders were doing during his day, like we said, they were sadly corrupting the law of Moses. And they were wanting to change it to where... Uh, the, where it was reserved only for the courts to only for personal retaliation. So in Deuteronomy 16, I mean, look, this is for the courts. Look how this is set, what it says. You shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates, which the Lord your God gives you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality nor take a bribe. Or for a bribe, blind the eyes of the wise and twist the words of the righteous. So as you can see there, uh, what what they were doing. And then we see as a case how uh, basically, you know, when you think about, okay, so we have the personal retaliation done by these Jews. And of course, they want to do, they want to personally retaliate against other people, right? Well, like we learned from the Bible, Punishment is reserved for the courts. And that's what the Bible teaches in Romans 13, 1 through 7. We learned that Paul talks about how the sword is not to be born in vain by the, by, the, by the government. So we need to think about that. Now, look at what else Jesus says. I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. So what is this? What does this mean? You slap someone on your cheek. Someone slaps you on the cheek. Oh, come on, come on. Go ahead and slap me again. <laughs> well, as you can recognize, the context of this is an insult. That's what this is qualified by. Because remember, Matthew 5, 10 through 12 talks about us praying for our enemies, praying for those who persecute against us. And basically what I believe Jesus is saying is you've got to patiently bear the insult. And this is exactly what Jesus did in his trial when he was he got slapped. Notice that Jesus didn't say, hey, come on, slap me on the other, other cheek. You know, no, he didn't do that. He was telling us to basically, basically to bear the insult. We see this even under Paul, Paul, the apostle, a servant of Jesus Christ. Look at what he did when he was on trial before the high priest Caiaphas, when he was slapped. Uh, you know, he did not, uh, you know, insult the high priest. So we see that what is Jesus trying to do? He's trying to teach us something. He's trying to do to transform us because if the world is like is in the business of personal retaliation, you fight against me, I'll fight against you. And that's the way the world works. But if you have somebody who personally who fights against you and you don't fight back then that creates a difference. They're going to see a difference in you, and they're going to wonder, why is he not fighting back? Why won't he? Why, come on, fight. Fight against me. And, of course, it, hopefully it starts to change them, and, they want, and they'll want to become a New Testament Christian. So in John 18, 22 and 23, when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? So notice there, Jesus did patiently bear the insult. In Acts 23, verse 1, Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, 
I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law. And do you command me to be struck a contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, who said, do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you not, shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, we go on, and Jesus says, If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. So, this is given in the situation of somebody sadly suing you. Okay, so if somebody sues you, uh, it says, okay, they sue you for your tunic, uh, let him have your cloak also. So what this was is the coat was a shirt-like undergarment and it was the less expensive garment worn. And so uh, the law of Moses actually talks about this. It's kind of interesting. Uh, it says that you could give this cloak as a pledge overnight, but it had to be returned. Uh, let me show you what it says. It says, if you ever take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering, it is his garment for his skin. What will he sleep in? And it will be when he cries to me, I will hear, for I am gracious. So what, what is Jesus trying to say? So you have the, basically a trivial matter here. If someone's suing you over a trivial matter, then don't, 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 let, don't let it sweat. You just allow him to get away with, get away with it. Don't personally retaliate against this person. Don't sue them back. And that's, I know, very hard, especially in our society, in Korean and American society. People are always suing each other. But we're supposed to be different. Now, don't, don't take this to mean, okay, he wants my car, then he can take my house also. <laughs> Remember, this is a trivial matter. This is not a big, big, expensive thing. And also we see that Jesus is teaching that a Christian who is unfairly accused over a minor matter should not enter into time-costing and consuming litigation, okay? I think that's what he's saying here. So it's wiser to hand over this, this garment than to insist upon your rights. Now, going on, it says, Whosoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Uh, I thought this was very interesting historically what's going on here. You know, the Persians came up with this idea of, of getting their enemies whom they conquered to help them with their supplies. Well, this trickled down, went to the Greeks and the Romans. They took it on as well, where they would have people carry stuff for them. So uh, we see this during the first century. The Jews, what would they do? They had to, when a Roman soldier said, hey, you're going to carry my armor for me. Come with me. So they travel with him for one mile. Well, notice what Jesus says. Not only just go one mile, but go with him too. I think we see an example of this in Matthew 27 where the Romans took somebody and they, 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 um, they just, you know, uh, you know, automatically said, hey, you come with me and travel with me. And I think this is found when Jesus was carrying his cross and he couldn't c carry it anymore. And so they got Simon of Cyrene to carry his cross for him. So... You, you have to notice, I mean, think about this for a moment. The Jews hated the Romans, right? I mean, that's their enemies. And so in their hearts, in the Jews' heart, they hate people. I mean, they hate these people. Oh, I don't want to carry this for them. But Jesus is saying, hey, you let your light so shine before men. You are so willing to not just go with him one mile, but go with him two. Show, show, show this person... Show these people how you are different, how you're my disciples. And that's what we need to really think about as Christians, that we love and desire to do good. Because I love how, it's, how God deals with his enemies sometimes. God deals with them in such a way that it converts them to the truth. And that's what we want to be about doing. Then notice the last thing of the bold teaching of Jesus. He says, give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. So when he's still speaking against personal retaliation here, okay, someone, uh, you have to qualify this, okay? So while, what we think, what we need to really think here is this is a real need, okay? A real need. 
This ain't just somebody asking you for money all the time. This is somebody with a real need asking you for money. And then, if the one is asking for money, we're not to refuse this person. Uh, And if we did withhold, that would be, in a sense, a form of personal retaliation. I mean, look at Deuteronomy 15. I think this is very interesting. It says, If there is among you a poor man of your brethren within any of the gates in your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. Beware, lest there be a wicked thought in your heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing. And he cry out to the Lord against you, and it shall become sin among you. You shall surely give to him, and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him. Because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your works, and in all in which you put your hand. And there's this principle even today with people with real needs. Now, we need to qualify this. This is for people with real needs, right? I mean, most of us are pretty rich. So we're not going to be receiving needs um, from... Uh, brethren who because we're all rich as we've learned from James 5 and second Thessalonians 3 10 though we have to qualify because if a person won't work then he doesn't eat right he won't eat so you have to qualify this that this is a person who is actually looking for work and they're going to try to find work it's not somebody who's just a lazy bum who doesn't do anything and then secondly I, I think it would it would definitely be immoral for us if we, if somebody who is a drunk or somebody who's a drug addict and they say, hey, give me money, and they go and feed their addiction on either drugs or alcohol, we should not assist them in their sin. And then we can learn from 1 Timothy 5, oh, what is the church to do when it comes to widows and orphans? Well, the Bible says that let their families, uh, let the families take care of those who are widows, as it says. But if they don't have a family, then, of course, the church ought to help them. So that's what we learned there. Now, if Christians had to give money, I mean, think about this. If we had to give money all the time to somebody, then we would run out of money soon, and then we wouldn't be able to help anybody. So we have to, think, qualify this, that this is referring to something about a selfish, heart, arrogant refusal. And then let's turn our attention to some applications I think that would help us. Number one, I think there are several things that God's people can do when we are wronged or when we're, when we're tempted to personally retaliate against others. First, we just need to recognize we need God's help in this area. That's the first thing. We need to recognize we need our Heavenly Father. Because as we learn from Jeremiah 10, 23, once again, O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not himself. You see... I'm not to be guided by my own self, but to be guided by God. And God knows the best. He knows the best way. And the best way is God's way. And so let us trust in the Lord with all our heart. That's what we're to do. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't think, oh, you know what? A personal vendetta against this person is the perfect plan for me. No, it's, that's not it. We should not be that way. Notice that even Jesus serves as our perfect example. I mean... Think about how he treated Satan. You know, Jesus used the word of God. He handled it rightly. And he was able to handle all that the devil put before him. And Jesus, he is God. And he has the right to uh, place the, put the devil in hell. And in which that's what he's going to do at the end of time. But Jesus did not retaliate against the devil even at that time. He And then we can learn about, I think, Saul and David is one of the perfect examples where Saul, he's on the hunt trying to kill David over and over and over again. But David never personally retaliates against Saul. And so look at some of these verses with me. Here's Jesus Christ. For this you were called because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was the seed found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Then you go to the story of David, and this is the first time. This is one of the first times David, uh, David was trying to be hunted, or was being hunted by Saul. 
So it says, David also arose afterward, went out of the cave, and called out to Saul, saying, My lord, the king. Uh, you remember he had cut off a little bit of... He could have killed Saul. I mean, he had the perfect opportunity, but he didn't. He cut off a little bit of his coat. And so when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. And David said to Saul, Why did you listen to the words of the men who say, Indeed, David seeks your harm. Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave, and someone urged me to kill you. But my eyes spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see. Yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. Know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you. Yet you hunt my life to take it. Let the Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me on you. But my hand shall be, not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients say, wickedness proceeds from the wicked, but my hand shall not be against you. And David exactly followed this. You shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people. And then you see it a second time in 1 Samuel chapter 26. And so when we think about this personal retaliation, uh, you know, it's so easy for us. I mean, it really is to get into that mode when somebody hurts us, when somebody harms us. Oh, I got to get in this mode of hurting them back. I got to personally retaliate against them. But we can be different. We're supposed to be different. And what we can do is obey God and pray to God to help us in this matter. Let us think about some other ways of how this is the best way to go. First, remember, just like Jesus was saying, the Pharisees, they had taken this something from the courts and they, they used it. Well, if, if a matter happens to come that you know is having to do with civil law, let, I mean, let's just say... Un- Someone murdered your daughter. Someone murdered your son. You, you're not going to personally make a vendetta to kill this person. You're going to let the courts handle that, as we see in Romans 13, 1 through 6. Secondly, follow Jesus' example. He was a perfect example of not personally retaliating against anyone. And then, of course, we looked at David. We even looked at, I mean, we could look at Joseph, even. Look at how Joseph, he had a heart of compassion and forgiveness and he did not retaliate against his brothers. And so, remember the kingdom of God. My kingdom is not of this world. We're supposed to be a different people. And so we must do better. And so, I ask us as God's people, let us be different from this wicked and evil world. And let us press on, press forward. Let's let, God, let's let it be in God's hands. Okay? And that's what we're supposed to do. Let it be in God's hands. So maybe this evening you've been thinking about uh, you're just not you're not even a, a Christian. I hope you've seen the truth of this matter that you know that Christ's teachings are totally different from what the world teaches, and you can see that He is someone very special. He is the Son of God, and I hope that you will want to believe on Him, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the mission of your sins. Or maybe if you're a child of God and you have something on your heart, you know that sin is on your heart and you need to ask for the prayers of your brothers and sisters and why don't you come forward and we'll pray for you. While together we stand and sing the invitation song.